In this last video on logic, we're going to be looking at some more predicate logic, looking at quantifiers, and we're going to be looking at the negation of a statement with quantifiers. So let's jump right in. Here's some statements. Just use some different words to show you how we can present it. But if I say there exists a natural number x such that x is greater than 20, that is a statement we want to check whether it's true or false. Well, I'm saying I can find a natural number that's bigger than 20. I hope you can find one. That's definitely true. Now, how do I lay out my argument to say it's true? Well, I'm saying I've got to find a number greater than 20. Let x be equal to 50. That number is then a natural number. So I'm going through the, ch the check is I can find a natural number greater than 20. So x is 50. 50 is a natural number. And... I know 50 is greater than 20. So that is why I can say my conclusion is true. Next one. For all natural numbers, they're greater than 20. Now there's a big difference between these two statements. The first one was that there exist, and now I've got a for all. Are all natural numbers greater than 20? Definitely not. I need to find one that's not. Well, same argument. Let x be equal to 4. 4 is a natural number. And 4 is not greater than 20. Or you can similarly say 4 is less than or equal to or just less than 20. But it's definitely not greater than 20. So that's why I can say it's false. There exists an integer that if I square it, I get 16. Yes, we know that. Let x be equal to 4. x could also be minus 4. 4 is an integer. So it meets the requirements here, and 4 squared is equal to 16. The next one, there exists a real number that if I square it, I get 10. Now, the type of numbers are very important here. If that was integer, then I couldn't find one, but I can definitely find a real number to square to get greater than 10, or to get equal to 10. Let x be equal to the square root of 10. That is a real number. And the square root of 10 squared gives me 10. So I can say that statement is true. So let's look at some combining x and y for all in there exist. For all real numbers, there exists a number. So if I pick any real number, I can find another real number. Such that if I multiply them, I get the number 1. Now we're thinking of multiplicative inverses. If I give you 5, what can you multiply with it to give you 1? 1 over 5. If I give you minus 1, you can multiply it with 1 to get 1. So these are multiplicative inverses. So it seems like most real numbers, I can find something to multiply with it to get 1. But with a statement like this, always check 0. 0 times what can give me 1? Nothing. So this is false. There's one outlier. There's one counterexample, and that's zero. Let x be equal to zero. Zero is a real number. And zero times y is equal to zero for all y's. No matter what value I choose, I'm going to get zero, so I'll never get one. So that's why this is false. Next one. There exists a real number for every other real number. So this means I can find one. That if I match it with every other real number, if I multiply it with that real number, I'll get that real number back. All right. Now, it might be a good idea to pause here and just read this statement again. Think it through and see if you what, what, what you think. True or false. All right. So, what this statement says, I can find a real number that for every other real number, if I multiply it with that real number, I get that number back. Now, you would think of the number one. 1 times 5 gives me 5. 1 times minus 3 gives me minus 3. What about 0? 1 times 0. Also 0. I get the number back. It seems to be working for most of them, and yes, it will. That is the multiplicative identity. So this statement is true. Let x be equal to 1. 1 is a real number. And 1 times y is equal to y for all real numbers y. Alright, 
Just note the difference. Now, the, the, the second portion of these first two are different. But note the difference that this order makes. If I say for all x, there exists a y, it means for every x, I can find a y to go with that x. But the second statement, I said there is an x that works for every y. So this is one specific number, the number 1. In the first example, we said for every x, I can find a y. So I found different values, except for the 0. But just note the difference between these two statements. They don't mean the same. Those are not interchangeable. All right, next one. For every integer, I can find another one that's bigger than that one. Well, if I give you an integer 5, you can give me... Or the first number must be bigger than the second number. If I give you 5, you can give me 4. 5 is bigger than 4. If I give you minus 10, is it bigger than anything? Yes. Minus 11. Every number you can give me, there's one that it's bigger than. So that there's a number smaller than or equal to that number. All right, so I can find something there. So let's take a look. Because it's a for all statement, I must use the general case because it seems to us that it's true. So I'm going to say let x be an integer. So how do I choose y to make sure x is every time bigger than y? Well, let y be equal to x minus 1. Let it just be one smaller. The first thing I need to then confirm is then y is also an integer, because y has to be an integer. If I start with an integer, I subtract 1, I will also get an integer. And x is greater than y. Since x is going to be greater than x minus 1 every time. So that's why it's true. For all statement, to prove it true, I need a general explanation. Next one, for all integers, I can find an integer such that if I square the integer, I get the other one. All right, think about this one. So for every number, I can find something that if I square that number, that number is an integer. So if I start with a number 10, can I find a number that is, is equal to square that? Well, 10 squared gives me 100. 1 squared gives me 1. Minus 5 squared gives me 25. So I can, if I square an integer, I get another integer. I can find that one. What about 0? If I square 0, I get 0, which is also an integer. So this one's pretty straightforward to be true. If x is, let x be any integer, and then let y just be x squared. All we need to confirm is that y is then also an integer. If I square any integer, I get an integer. So we're happy, so it is true. Right, let's look at the negation of statements. If I've got a quantified statement, to negate it, what does that mean? If I say, I've got a statement for all x, something is true. The negation of that would then be, that there exists an x for which that thing is false. So just think it through logically. If I say for all x something is true, the negation is not that it's always false. The negation is that there must be some x for which it's false. So if it's true for all, it doesn't mean the negation of that, that it's false for all. It means there exists one for which it's false. If I say I can find an x for which a statement in true is true, the negation is that of that is for all x, it's not true, or the negation of the statement is true. All right. And then if I've got a compound statement, that's how I'm going to look at it. The negation of there exists is for all and the other way around. But let's look at some real examples. If I say there exists a natural number n, that if I cube it, I get minus 27. We want to look at the negation of the statement. So before we look at the truth value of the statement, let's just lose, use these rules to look at what the negation of the statement is. If I look at the negation of there exists a natural number n for which the cube is minus 27. The negation of that, so we're looking at statements, so the negation of that is logically equivalent to saying for all natural numbers n, x cube is not minus 27. Okay. But let's look at our original statement. Is that original statement true or false? Because if the original statement is true, my negation has to be false. If my original statement is false, 
my negation has to be true from logic. So, can I find a natural number that I cubed to get minus 27? Now, we know that minus 3 cubed is minus 27. But minus 3 isn't a natural number. Every natural number is positive, so if I cube it, I'll get a positive number. So this original statement I know is false. So the question is, will my negation be true? It has to, but let's test it. Every natural number, if I cube it, I, I, it's not minus 27. That is definitely true, because my natural numbers are all positive, so if I cube them, I will get positive numbers. So this works. Next one. For every real number, if I square it, it's greater than or equal to the original number. Well, the negation of this statement is then logically equivalent to there exists a real number r, such that x squared is not greater than or equal to x. Now, what does not greater than or equal to mean? It means less than. That's a much tidier way than to just draw a line through the not greater than or equal to. So, my original statement, for all real numbers, if I square it, I get something greater than or equal to the original one. Well, does it work for zero? If I square zero, it's equal to zero, so that works. Negative numbers, minus 10, if I square it, I get 100, that's greater than or equal to minus 10, that works. Um, positive numbers, 10 squared is greater than or equal to 10. What about fractions? A half squared. Is a half squared greater than or equal to a half? If I look at a half squared, I get a quarter. Is a quarter greater than or equal to a half? Definitely not. So this original statement is false. So let's see if my negation is true. I can find a real number x such that x squared is less than x. Well, there's my, count, there's my example, a half. A half squared is less than a half, so that's true. Now, what this shows, and that's where the whole logic comes in, it's more difficult to prove a for all statement. It's sometimes easier to prove that there exists, because I only need to find one. For all, I need to look at all of them. So to prove this for all statement true, or for all statement false, I can prove the negation true. If I know the negation is true, then my original statement is false. So what am I saying? I'm looking at the truth value of A, a statement A. But I have proven that not A is true. So my conclusion is that A is false. And it's easier sometimes to prove the, look at the negation than at the original statement. And that's where those truth tables where we started with comes in handy. Because if I want to prove a statement, I've got to see what is easier. Can't I look at the negation? If it's an implication, can't I look at the contrapositive? So that's where that comes in. So just some more statements. I'm not going to look at the original statements. You can check. But negating these statements, the negation of there exists a natural number x, such that x is greater than, or greater than 20, the negation is for all natural numbers x x is less than or equal to 20 because the negation of greater than is less than or equal to now the next statement's got a for all and there exists in the negation of that statement the, neg the statement is for all integers x that exists an integer y such that x is greater than y the negation of that is there exists an integer x for all integers y such that x is less than or equal to y. Now, we've already shown that there is the original statement was true, and it makes sense that this negation is false, because what this says is, I can find the smallest integer, and that's not possible. Right, and the last one, the negation of the statement, there exists a real number, and we already looked at this, our real number was 1. But the negation is for all real numbers x, there exists a real number y, such that x times y is not equal to y. That's the negation of my statement. All right, my original statement was true. Can you show this statement to be false? All right, in this case, it's easier to prove the original one.